Final, final panel uh, titled Accountability for the Torture Memos. This issue has basically been simmering for about four or five months now, um, ever since the, the release of the of what, what I'm going to say probably for the first and last time, the so-called torture memos, and we'll probably dispense with the so-called after, uh, after just a few minutes. Um, they were released in April, and then calls immediately came from both sides for more information, from, um, from every, every part of the left all the way to the, to the right, to Dick Cheney, who requested more information that would, that would explain why, these tor why, why this wasn't torture and why even if it was, it was actually legitimate. Since then, we got an inspector general's report, less redacted this time than the first time. And then, um, and then Attorney General Eric Holder announced a preliminary review of uh, CIA torture practices, um, but put a real brackets on just how far he would go and what exactly he was looking for. And now, um, Michael pointed out to me just before this panel that three days ago, um, Judge Balthazar Garzon in Spain has um, said he is, despite change in Spanish law regarding universal jurisdiction, he is moving forward with prosecutions of the Bush Six, which includes uh, Attorney General, former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez and John Yu, among others, in the Bush administration, and including also Vice President Dick Cheney's former Chief of Staff. So um, maybe it's safe to say that what was simmering is now close to boiling. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll sort of get started and talk a lot about just, we're going to start with kind of what constitutes torture and what's the difference between torture and enhanced interrogation techniques. Um, sort of if it looks like a duck, talks like an enhanced interrogation technique, and uh, walks like torture, I guess, then what is it exactly? But let me introduce who we have on the panel. Uh, all the way across the table here, the man who needs no introduction, but I should explain is sitting in for Kai Ambos, is Michael Scharf. Um, next to him, Cassandra Robertson, also of the Case School of Law. She, is, uh, she teaches civil procedure and professional responsibility here, and um, she's going to speak a, a little bit later on uh, in addition to everything we talk about, but she'll be probably illuminating some thoughts about identity theory and what that says uh, about what the torture memos and people's, and the people's attitudes towards torture actually says about how our society is changing. Julian Koo is in the middle here. He is from Hofstra. He's the associate dean at Hofstra University School of Law. He served as a clerk in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and he teaches now international constitutional and corporate law at Hofstra. Also, uh, Jordan Paust is with us here as well from the University of Houston Law Center. He um, is the Mike and Teresa Baker Law Center professor of international law. He's written about a gajillion books, chapters of books, and articles. And uh, he's also a former instructor of international law at the Army's JAG School. And lastly, Stephanie Ferrier is the director of international and comparative law programs at Vermont Law School, not Brandeis, as it says in your programs. Um, she's former chief counsel at Amnesty International. And uh, her research focuses on the role of international organi organizations in protecting human rights. So I want to throw this out here um, as the, the very first question that, and Julian, I'd like, to, I'd like to start with you. Why is there this focus, or was there this focus so many years ago on redefining what it is that, uh, that interrogators do as enhanced interrogation versus torture? Well, actually, I don't, I actually don't know the answer why. Uh, I think the, the interesting thing is that at least to me, what happened was that uh, there, were, there, there was not so much redefining, at least in some purposes, although there might be an argument about that. There was an attempt to define uh, the terms of the torture statute, the statute that implemented U.S. In, uh, obligations under the Convention Against Torture. Um, and that was what led to this uh, current contretemps. Uh, the attempt to define uh, the, the, the so-called torture memos um, was uh, obviously a much attacked and vilified attempt to do so. Um, but I actually, you know, I have a variety of views on this, but among which is that uh, an attempt to define it was a, was a difficult uh, thing to do, and uh, one of which perhaps uh, needed to be done, though, because it, uh, a defin an attempt to define what it was is something, although perhaps it backfired in some ways, it was mistaken in some ways, uh, something that needed to be done to give guidance to uh, folks as to what the torture statute uh, required. 
why was the line drawn where it was? Why was waterboarding, and according to these memos, right, waterboarding wasn't torture, it was enhanced interrogation and okay. And uh, putting, you know, uh, putting somebody in a box with, a, with, with an insect that wasn't, that wasn't poisonous but you were told was a scorpion was actually okay and not torture. Um, why, if, if waterboarding had been defined as torture before, why was it being redefined as enhanced interrogation? Um, well, actually, I mean, I think that wa the point was interesting to me. Let me say a couple things. One is that the definitions are just not as clear as sometimes people say. I think there is a consensus on waterboarding, although and, and there is past practice on waterboarding. And so the memo's attempt to define waterboarding as legal was obviously the weakest part of that memo. But the insect stuff was something that no one had ever probably thought of very much before. Um, and what, what I think, but I think that what I think what's interesting, let's put it another way, is that although we can complain about the attempt to define torture, no one's tried to do so since because uh, for a variety of reasons, people spend time yelling at them and screaming and charging them in Spanish courts. Uh, the Obama administration, it can't possibly be true that torture is anything that's not in the UCMJ, any kind of interrogation. I don't think that's right. I think an attempt, there needs to be some attempt to actually give it some content. It may be that their uh, definitions were wrong. I certainly think they, uh, they seem to make a mistake on a couple areas, but I'm not convinced that uh, that it's as easy as most, people, most critics say it is, that, well, it's clear, everything in that memo was, uh, was clearly torture, um, and that it's quite so easy to define torture. So I think, it, it, at least to me, it seemed like a good faith attempt to define torture, which may have been mistaken in some areas, but was, in fact, an attempt to define what torture was. Or to define what torture was not, what wasn't yeah, right. torture, really, what was allowable. Right. Stephanie and then Mike. I was going to start with one response, but you said it was a good faith attempt. And I have to say that I really question the good faith of people who wrote that waterboarding was not torture. The U.S. had prosecuted uh, waterboarding. Um, so many people, uh, even after it was finally revealed that waterboarding was supposedly okay, and a former JAG officer said, no, it's illegal, it's a crime. It is torture. Um, there really wasn't a question in my mind that it might not be. And so the question about why is or a mistake of fact defense. And this defense, even more troubling, has now been codified in a statute, the 2005 Detainee Treatment Act. And what this act says is that anybody in the government who relied reasonably on these legal memos that we call the torture memos cannot be prosecuted for following the advice in the memos. And why it's particularly troubling is because there's two kinds of memos. There's one kind that's very specific where the CIA said, we want to do the following 24 things. Are they torture? They included the bug. They included waterboarding. And John Yu, who was the predecessor of Jack Goldsmith, looked at each one and said, no, it's not torture. It's not torture. He gave some parameters, and it is possible to exceed that authority. But the troubling part is there was a general memo on what does the torture statute, which implements the torture convention, mean. And on the section of specific intent, the intent required to prosecute, it said that only people, and I'm paraphrasing here, who are committing these acts in a sadistic manner, who intend to cause serious injury, can be prosecuted for torture. If 
serious injury results, either psychological or physical, but that wasn't your intent, and you weren't being sadistic, you were just trying to help your country, then it's not torture. And under that definition, nothing can be torture except for maybe the rare case where we read about this report, um, the Inspector General's report, where they were um, waterboarding repeatedly, and the lower level people said it's not working, the guy's going crazy, and the superior said, we don't care, keep doing it. And that's probably the only case that I can think of that would meet that definition. So the, 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 the act itself does, is irrelevant. It's the intent. It's the, you have to determine the emotional state of the person ordering it or, or carrying it out. If, yes. If that memo is the one that controls for interpretation of this subsequent federal statute, that is exactly how it would be interpreted. Lot, this, uh, well, hold, hold on just a second. I want, I want to just bracket something that I want to make sure we get to later, which is the question of whether or not the memos constitute an example of bad lawyering or maybe possibly criminal lawyering, because I think, if, I think that's germane, but I want to get to that later. Jordan, go ahead. Uh, the really uh, seriously unprofessional lawyering is involved, especially if you get a request from Riso at, at CIA, and he's only focusing on torture. And you know that much more than torture is criminally proscribed. The audience might not know, but under human rights law, treaty based, customary international law, under the laws of war, under the Convention Against Torture, under the Inter American uh, Declaration of uh, Rights and Duties of Man, through the OIS Charter, this whole panoply of prohibitions may involve torture, and if it isn't torture, cruel treatment, and if it isn't cruel treatment, inhumane treatment, if it's not inhumane treatment, degrading treatment. Moreover, the memo wasn't a uh, golden shield. It was made of fool's gold, and it was full of holes because the Michael knows the standard uh, with respect to uh, specific intent is the intent to engage in conduct that the community knows is criminal. And it's, you don't have to be have this extra egregious uh, you know, uh, adjective or adverb or whatever attached to it. And uh, moreover, uh, what is what is has been criminally proscribed as uh, waterboarding, as Stephanie intimated before, has been considered to be torture. There are 29 United States cases, federal cases and state court cases, that have already recognized that waterboarding is torture. If it wasn't torture, it could be cruel treatment. It's similarly in, uh, illegal. And What's really interesting is that there were country reports put out by the executive branch before the Bush administration. And during the Bush administration, during the time of these memos that recognized the water boarding and the water cure and similar ducking of heads in uh, water uh, to induce uh, suffocation, for example, were, were torture. So it doesn't, it doesn't really even matter. There was a definition, by the way, in the CAT, the Convention Against Torture. And it is a definition that's widely used. It's already been used in the international criminal tribunals. It's severe physical or mental suffering. Um, I guess what you're referring to is what is severe, and that has to be tested. But we, we know what, that waterboarding has been labeled as torture. The cold cell inducement of, uh, of uh, hypothermia is torture. It's in the U.S. country reports about human rights records of other countries. And we have some federal cases and state court cases on that. And we know that uh, threatening to kill has been labeled as torture. We know that stripping a person naked and use of dogs for terroristic purposes have been labeled as torture. So it's, it's really a no, there's hardly any question. So the lawyering involved in that second binding memo in August 2002 um, and in the Bradbury memos, which is in 2005, was at least professionally irresponsible on the one hand, or intentionally uh, trying to obviate the matter and trying to, to find cover for, for lawyers. But the main point is not about, in my opinion, the main point from an international criminal law perspective, especially as we're talking about prosecutions in Spain, it's not the legal ethics issue, it's a question of complicity. And that standard is well known in international. We can talk about complicity later and what the standard is. Certainly. Cassandra, I want to hear from you in a, sort of on, the, on that issue of per professional responsibility. And right. I just, I keep wondering, what does this look like? What does the conversation look like by me and Bradbury and you sitting around a table? They get this call from CIA, we want, or this, mem this, this email, 
or they didn't use emails, they got a, a phone call, whatever it was. Right. We want to do X, Y, Z, and all of these other things. And they say, all right, let's figure this out. Like, what does that look like? Right. Um, well, I think it starts even earlier, because especially with you, he wasn't just involved in the lawyering side of it. He's also involved in the policy side of it. Um, he was somebody that the administration turned to. He was um, part of the War Council, who was really devising the policies for how to handle the war on terror. Um, I think this probably gave him a vested commitment then in you know, when he tries to go give an analysis of the legality of some of these strategies. These are strategies that he personally believes are very important to winning the war on terror. And he says as much in his book as well. Um, what does that mean from a professional responsibility standpoint? Well, one of a lawyer's duties is to provide independent advice. Um, I don't actually believe, and we'll get the Office of Professional Responsibility report later, I don't actually believe that he was pressured into providing bad advice or that you know he was somehow venally trying to make the law look something other than he knew it to be. I think he was an absolute true believer who believed strongly in the policy and was therefore blind to some of the downsides in the law. Um, so bad lawyering, not necessarily bad faith lawyering. Can I jump in here because there's a lot here that there's so much to disagree with that I'm going to have to just pick a few things. Um, I, I think I think we, we want to be careful here blending because I think we could all take different um, different views on what is and what is not torture. I think what's fascinating, at least to me, is that I mean, for most of the critics of the memos, I think it's easy to jump on the weakest part of the memos, which is waterboarding, which is the weakest part. I think I can see totally the, um, but I think. The fact that no one's in the Obama administration is not willing to define torture, right? I don't think any 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 self-respecting government lawyer ever presented with that question again will write a memo trying to define what is or is not torture in a fair-minded way without being subject to, I think, the t the kind of sort of uh, you know uh, blowback that that we're getting. I think because, for instance, the line is, I think, I really do think it's it, there are some strong disagreements on what is or what is not torture. I think there are disagreements about, say, whether or not uh, threatening someone with a gun rises to a level of torture, severe mental suffering. There are disagreements about the standard of specific intent. The Third Circuit, in a recent opinion interpreting CAT, did adopt a version of the specific intent interpretation of the CAT that was at least a version of that which was adopted in the torture memo, the Convention Against Torture. So, I mean, I think, I, to me, I think, I think there's, there, are, there are some areas where you could argue that there are mistakes that were made. But to argue that, I think that it was, it's a clear-cut, simple issue, uh, defining what is or is not torture, especially once you get outside the discussion of waterboarding, I think is, is, it's, it's, not, it's not an accurate description of the legal landscape. And to add to what Julian's saying, one act of waterboarding, you know, we may now think is, is torture. And that's all that John Yu was looking at, is waterboarding once. He didn't talk about 182 times nor does his memo talk about doing all the 24 things in the aggregate. Um, when he says sleep deprivation is okay, it's not necessarily the case that he thought that they would do it for six months. And so there is a sliding scale based on the fact-specific inquiry when something crosses between something that, that would be inhuman and degrading treatment to the, the harsher crime of torture. Some of what was permitted uh, besides waterboarding, including slamming a prisoner's head repeatedly against a wall or sleep deprivation for many days on end. These kinds of acts are things that for years have been determined to be torture by the full range of uh, human rights courts and UN treaty bodies. So if one were to want to explain, well, what does to somebody, what does constitute uh, torture? How do we determine this? Um, a second year law student, not first year because you're still studying your first year subjects, but it said, what would they do? They would see, well, what has already been, and it is very fact specific, and it, uh, what constitutes severe um, physical or mental pain or suffering? What, what is sufficient to, to uh, write, have it rise to that level? One of the interesting things that I found is the administration several times, and some of their supporters, um, did in fact refer to a European Court of Human Rights case, saying, well, some of these techniques, the European Court of Human Rights said, are not torture. And so we're not doing anything that uh, isn't uh, permitted. Two very important points uh, in that regard. First of all, 
as Jordan pointed out. Torture is not all that's prohibited by these treaties that the United States has ratified and incorporated into its domestic law. It's torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. That case is Ireland versus United Kingdom, decided in 1978. There were the five techniques which, uh, which the European Commission, at first went to the European Commission on Human Rights. They looked at these five techniques in combination. They said, well, if these are all done um, together, this, they unanimously decided they amount to torture. What are they? Having someone uh, lean, have to lean up, it's called um, wall standing. They have to lean up against a wall, but they're just touch it with their fingers. Then they're away from the wall, spread eagle, standing on their toes. So the weight is primarily on the fingers for hours, standing like that. And Rumsfeld, by the way, Boys, said, I stand for six hours a day, so why is that considered bad? Um, yeah. Combined with uh, sleep deprivation, deprivation of food and drink, intense noise uh, as, <coughs> as well, and hooding, having a, a dark cloth over the head. So these five techniques used together, the commission said unanimously, constituted torture. But then the case went to the European court, um, which interests Sir Nigel Rodley, who's, who is the world's leading expert on torture, has, has uh, remarked, uh, besides finding that the court's reasoning was, was lacking, um, said that it's interesting because the court didn't actually look in, in a detailed way at the facts um, the way the commission had. And the court <laughs> said no. Um, this was in a 13 to 4 decision. So 4 said it was torture. 13 said it wasn't. Um, because it doesn't have, doesn't rise to the level of cruelty that amounts to torture, but 16 to 1, the European Court of Human Rights said, that it unquestionably amounts to cruel and degrading treatment. So it was still illegal, it just didn't amount to torture. Okay, final point on this case. That was 1978. In the Selmuni case, the year, this is years later, 1999, some of those similar techniques came before the European Court of Human Rights. There were <laughs> repeated beatings and sustained beatings over a period of several days. And the court in that case said that certain acts which were classified in the past as inhuman and degrading treatment as opposed to torture could be classified differently in the future. They said the European Convention on Human Rights has a similar torture prohibition that we have, um, is a living instrument and must be interpreted in light of present day conditions. And the court in the Selmuni case found that the large number of blows inflicted on the uh, detainee uh, being dragged along by his hair and so forth, being threatened um, with a blow lamp, it would be heinous and humiliating and they determined it was torture. So if the court were to look at uh, Ireland versus UK today, I think they would determine it's torture. But in any event, it was still illegal. Can I, uh, two uh, other can I just add? Julian and then Jordan, and then I, I have a, a question to move us in a slightly different direction. Yeah. Go ahead. Just a quick technical note. CID was not uh, criminalized by the torture statute that they were interpreting. So, CID. Uh, cruel and human degrading punishment. That was the distinction. That's why they went through the analysis. European Court of Human Rights said, well, it's not torture, it's cruel and human degrading punishment. They were interpreting the torture statute, which only punishes, criminalizes torture, and specifically does not criminalize cruel and human and degrading punishment. Just to clarify, the U.S. doesn't do cruel and usual and inhumane punishment. But you're not, but if you're interpreting, if you're interpreting, if you're interpreting the torture statute, if your job, and maybe they should have had a wider scope, that's a different issue. But if you're interpreting the torture statute to say that some, to rely on that opinion is not unreasonable because the opinion said, well, this is not torture, it's Wait, this other stuff, right? Not, and that, tort, that, and that is not, stuff it's that not illegal. Haven't done until now. Which, is not, which is not illegal under this statute and, and was specifically, uh, the U.S. put a reservation to try to limit the impact of the CID uh, and they limited it to say whatever the Fifth and Eighth Amendment would prohibit. So that was a different analysis on, so CID, cruel and human degrading punishment was used as a distinction, say, is to help us define what is and is not torture. Now, maybe something cruel and human degrading punishment should not be permitted. Maybe it, it is illegal, but it's not illegal under that statute, which is the one they're interpreting. Okay, okay, Jordan. A, a, a lawyer's asked a 
question. This is, this is a, Lawrence asked a question by Riso at CIA. Um, I'd like to engage in these techniques, waterboarding, uh, the coffin in the box, and with the recognition of what consequences were. Waterboarding induces suffocation, and a significant threat of death, fear of death, and increased anxiety. So does the coffin in, in certain circumstances. Well, one problem concerning professional responsibility is that the lawyer could simply turn on the lawyer's computer. This is not unusual for the younger generation. You turn on your computer, and you find <coughs> what we call computer-assisted research. These cases, the U.S. cases and foreign cases, uh, that have addressed waterboarding as torture, the specific techniques, and so you go through them. Uh, it's not a question of definition as much as just turn your computer on, find the case about waterboarding, use of dogs for terrorist purposes, threatening to kill the individual or family member. It's all there. Um, why weren't the computers turned on, or were they turned on, and the, the uh, memos were written with knowledge of these cases out there? I think there's a, 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 inter and, an internet blackout. Yeah, the, other, the other problem is, if you're a lawyer and you've got this request, I don't think you're professionally responsible. You're being professionally responsible unless you understand the interests of your client, even if they don't. They're talking about certain techniques, and you should realize we've got a war crime statute that doesn't just prohibit torture. We've got a war crime statute that prohibits also cruel treatment and inhuman treatment as a war crime in the federal district courts. Why wasn't the War Crimes Act addressed? Why weren't the customary laws of war addressed? Why weren't human rights laws addressed? Only the CAT, the Convention Against Torture, and this one federal statute is so selective that it's at least extremely unprofessional and suspicious. But we want to talk okay, about so, criminal complicity. Yes, well, let's, I, want to get to, I want to get to this accountability issue. We've been talking about kind of defining and redefining and, uh, uh, torture versus enhanced interrogation. But if, um, if, we're fa if, if Attorney General Eric Holder, let's stick with the, what's happening domestically and leave the international stuff alone for just a second. If Attorney General Eric Holder's, uh, if a, investigation, it's not his investigation, it's John Durham's mm -hmm. investigation, finds that um, that there was wrongdoing. Is that just going to stop with the people who went beyond the letter of the torture memos? Because they were relying on sound legal advice, except, it, or, or, or <laughs> believe they were relying, they, they were believed they were relying on sound legal advice. Is that where that investigation will stop? Is that limited? in that way, and is that okay? Cassandra. Well, okay. well, I was just gonna say that I think even if they try to limit it to that at the outset, I think that people's defense will be, this was authorized by people above me, and I think those issues will have to come up even if they aren't intended to be brought up in the beginning. But if that happened with Abu Ghraib, and it stopped, it did not go above. As I mentioned before, there's this statute, the 2005 Detainee Treatment Act, and Jordan is not addressing it, and it's going to be a real obstacle to this criminal investigation because it says, by a matter of federal law, if you relied in good faith on any of these memos that were written by the lawyers in the White House and OLC, that is a defense. And the only thing you can now prosecute are acts that occurred before the memos, acts that clearly exceeded the memos, or acts where, as in the case of the waterboarding, repeatedly they didn't want to do it and someone uh, above them said, no, I order you to do it anyway, even though they, they knew it wasn't working. Well, that federal law is well, going to be a problem. How do you get around well, it, Jordan? Well, Michael, we know that under international law, there is a defense uh, with respect to manifest illegality, uh, right? If the, if the lawyer uh, is acting bad apples at the bottom, the ones that had cover under, alleged cover under them, they, they might have a defense in terms of manifest illegality. Mm -hmm. What was authorized, called for a patent obvious manifest illegality. It's a test we use in the world war areas. <coughs> and that's what they were talking about in the MCA, actually, too. Mm -hmm. So that might work for some people, but I don't believe that that can work for lawyers. We can disagree. No, no, I agree with you. I think a lawyer can turn their Riso 
Oh no no no! I totally agree with you. I was I was looking at the lower level. Once you get up to the lawyers. Well, who said what to whom after the memo? The memo went to Russo in CIA. What? Who said what to whom all the way down that chain? And um, I, I think you, you can you can plausibly imagine that for the for CIA for the interrogators and the people who are supervising the interrogators, their defense is. Well, DOJ said the Department of Justice said it was okay, so we did what they said was okay, and we were following. When they told that, we don't know. Did they see the memo? You know. Well, I, what, I, what got to the lowest level CIA type? Wait, can I just interrupt? Because I, you're going to. So <laughs> <laughs> the reason, the reason for this, one of the reasons that hasn't been brought out is that the CIA for years has not done. Potentially controversial things without a legal opinion and saying it's okay. And that's because of the investigations and prosecutions going back 30 years in which individual agents were called to account for things they thought they were lawfully instructed to do. Okay, and, and see, and that's my point is that if that's the case, we can sort of leave the CIA aside for a second because we're ta not talking about accountability for torture, we're talking about accountability for the torture memos. Not what was done with them, but the, but the writing of them. But it'll come out. I mean, you'll so, be looking at the whole So it seems as though domestically with, with what Eric Holder is doing, with, the, with what the Attorney General's office is doing right now, that that's really limited to the interrogation itself. Mm -hmm. Is there any domestic uh, mechanism that will look at the writing of the memos itself and determine whether or not that that what was done there by John Yu and Bybee and Bradbury and all these guys was legal. Cassandra was right. He has to, as a, a federal prosecutor, follow the evidence trail. And the evidence trail is going to lead inextricably to the authors of the torture memos. I started this conference by giving a quote from one of the Nuremberg trials that involved judges being prosecuted for perverting the law and using it as a weapon against the civilian population. What Jordan is describing is exactly that, that the authors of the torture memos, whether they had a blind good faith, like you described, John Yu, or not, were so careless in their job as government lawyers who are supposed to do a comprehensive job and give their clients all the legal information so that they can make an informed decision, that they have become tantamount to the judges in the theory of liability, not the, the number of deaths, of Nazi Germany. And, and this is, um, we had Judge Rod uh, in the audience just a few minutes ago. He is a case um, special judge who's a, a visiting jurist. But he was the judge who took on Saddam Hussein. And he's the one who investigated Saddam Hussein's chief judge, Al-Bandar, who was just convicted recently for doing the same thing they did at Nuremberg using the revolutionary courts as a weapon. Well, how is what these folks that are writing the torture memos, how is that in legal theory different? Julian's term. Yeah, I, I find the not- Our single apologist for the-, the <laughs> Yeah, and actually including our moderator, right? Uh, yeah. Um, no, I mean, look, uh, yeah, I don't- <laughs> Wow, I became the apologist. All right, <laughs> so- I apologize. Yeah, um, no, I know where you're coming from. All right, so- Here's, here's, I actually find the Nazi example not that persuasive because, the, first of all, almost all those cases were judges, right? The, many of them were judges. Well, and, and the you. pattern, and there was, it was over years and years of pattern of, and, and several of them were clearly sort of the, the theory of prosecution was they received specific benefits for being part of the regime as payback and the allegations where they're sort of co-opted into the system. So I actually think if that's your, if that's your one precedent, that's not going to get you very far. I also think that the obsession with getting the lawyers is actually kind of unhealthy, but this is just a broader point. There's almost this obsession, which reminds me of my own, perhaps, I was never really obsessed, but some of the obsession with getting Clinton, right? The obsession is getting Cheney, right? And everything we can do to get to the people around him and him is informing some of the interest and excitement about uh, pursuing these prosecutions, which I guess in my view, I think, domestically for the reasons Mike said, are pretty much going to go nowhere um, and have almost no chance of any serious, F, uh, anyone actually being prosecuted in a U.S. court, certainly none of the lawyers, and probably none of the interrogators as well. I think it's just going to be a very big show with almost no sort of you're, results at the end. You're referring to political realities 
Um, but, but I also think because the, legally, I, I just don't think there's that strong of a case. What about, what, I mean, Michael made some very, some very harsh statements about the, those lawyers as having been careless. And, 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 and more than that, and, and, and Jordan mentioned that they ignored uh, all sorts of international cases and so on and so forth. I mean, what about that? Well, I think, at least in part, I haven't studied this issue as well as I guess Jordan has. But I think the one thing that you, you want to be careful about is not all the international sources are relevant to interpreting the federal statute, which is just a basic point, right? So country reports about other countries' uh, torture practices issued by the State Department are to some degree relevant, but they're not as relevant as U.S. court opinions interpreting, right? So th there's, a, there's a lot of international sources out there, right? S some of which have different levels of persuasiveness. Now, they did review some international precedents. It's true they didn't review all of them, right? And I, I'm sure that we can get into the game of, well, they should have looked at this opinion or that opinion. There are a lot of opinions that don't get to everything. I think what really people are obsessed with is the conclusion. And the conclusion, I admit, is a really awful conclusion to come to. But I'm not, I guess I'm not as convinced that the method w that they got there was that, uh, was, was as shocking. Maybe the conclusion they got to, I was shocked Julian, at. Julian, how the, do you deal the with method. the um, Department of Justice uh, recent ethics review where the final report's not out yet, but they've already been indicating what's in it um, publicly, and it is consistent with the description of, uh, or the characterization of Jordan in mind, that the method that these folks did um, was so bad that there should be disciplinary proceedings, if not criminal proceedings, against the authors of these memos. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen, I'd be waiting to see that report. I mean, but, but I guess just one thing about, I mean, I, I, I just, and, and on ethical issues, maybe, the one thing I would criticize the memos for, I guess maybe there's more than one thing, but at the very least, the memos obviously did not address seriously enough uh, the, the possible alternative interpretations <laughs> Uh, that would be, and that the problems with their interpretations, which might be reasonable on some level, but which obviously a lot of people are going to disagree with, and obviously the, they need to let the clients know <laughs> that this interpretation is going to be probably problematic for a lot of people, um, even if it's plausible or reasonable. And that, I think, is part of the ethical duty that may or may not have been sort of adequately fulfilled. Perhaps they should have gotten a second opinion. Again, you know, in that step. again it's not just a legal ethics issue. It's an issue concerning what we call complicity. The case was United States versus Ulster, and, and it was a U.S. military prosecution in a military commission, in the subsequent military commission, such as at Nuremberg, um, of, of very high level officials. But it involved some lawyers from the German Ministry of Justice who wrote memos. In, and they knew or were aware that their memos facilitated actions in the Holocaust criminal under the law of war. And the test for complicity is, did you intend to engage in conduct? You wrote your memo. And you knew or were aware that your memo would facilitate, can or will assist, what will be a direct perpetrator in the commission of something called waterboarding or use of dogs to terrorize or death threats. You don't have to know, as the lawyer writing the memo, that what the direct perpetrator is doing is torture or cruel or inhumane. You've got decisions of the International Criminal Tribunal for the form of those mafia, recognizing that it's the factual quality of your complicit behavior that's critical. You intend to engage the act. You knew or were aware that your conduct would facilitate what factually is waterboarding. You don't have to know that it's torture. You don't have to know that it's a crime. Ignorance of the law, even by a lawyer, is no excuse. Um, and, and that's critical and unavoidable. They're not talking yeah. anymore about you know, parsing the, uh, interpretations of one case when 29 US was... cases could be found on a computer. It's a simple test. Did you intend to write your memo? Yes. And you were asked about, you knew that it was to, to facilitate waterboarding. Yes. Uh, and waterboarding was actually facilitated. There was also a... In terms of the International Criminal Tribunal prosecutions for complicity, aiding and abetting, you're there already. There was so, also a process. So, so uh, this is okay. a, an unavoidable duty of Eric Holder that I hope we'll get around to. What is Eric Holder's duty when we get other input from that on this uh, particular question? And what is the President's duty now, knowing uh, more about what had happened, because what's been spilled, 
and more is coming out. All right, there was also a oh, process. Sorry. I want to address the point about, um, well, it's not, not all uh, international precedents or cases are as relevant or international sources. So I guess we can pick and choose, which is what was done. We chose a 1978 decision and ignored all the European court decisions since then. It's not just Salmouni, that's the one I quoted because they clearly alluded to what had been decided in 78 and uh, indicated they probably would have decided differently. But, um, and it's also not just waterboarding, but very much you know, the slamming of people repeatedly um, against a wall or uh, con continually beating them. Um, so in the European court, we have Aden versus Turkey, blindfolded, beaten, stripped placed in a tire sprayed with high pressure water, 97, Aksoy versus Turkey, stripped naked, arms tight. I mean, there are cases after, that's just the European court. But then we have all the cases that have gone to the uh, Human Rights Committee. Um, and I have a long list of them on this page, but they have to do with beatings with rubber truncheons, punches, kicks, hanging them, um, and putting them up against a wall, several cases of uh, submarino, so submersing somebody um, in foul water, yeah, submarining them, um, and 15 days of physical beatings. And here's one, beatings, deprivation of food, insufficient uh, food, being forced to stand upright while blindfolded throughout the day, and only being permitted to sleep for a few hours of the day. All of these were torture, and you don't have to be adept on the internet to find all of these cases. They're all in... And and my it's point, so it's not I want to draw on both of your, your things because there's a really crucial thing here, and it's a process issue. Even if they couldn't find it on the internet, what John Yu says in his book is that he specifically, purposefully cut out the State Department Office of Legal Advisor. The experts on that didn't let them clear on the memos, didn't want to hear what they had to say, didn't allow the professional military lawyers to weigh in. And what does he say in his book? He says very clearly, we did it because we knew that they were going to have contrary advice, and we were afraid that the president might not do what we wanted him to do. He admits it in his book, and that process issue, I think, is, is the nail, really, for the criminal case. There's, there's a bigger issue that has to do with the functioning. I mean, I think Attorney General Eric Holder is probably very invested in the power of his office and the power of the Department of Justice. And if former DOJ lawyers are prosecuted, does that then put a muzzle and, um, and uh, unhealthy fear on that office and that department in terms of their ability to do their job? Cassandra. I don't think it would, actually. Um, and I mean, this gets back to part of my argument on identity theory and perceptual filters, right? I think people are very good at filtering out information that they don't want to see um, and filtering in the information that they do. Um, and I suspect that the Holder Justice Department will not view themselves in the actions of what took place under the Bush Justice Department. But I, but I think that there is a real risk here. I mean, there are actually a lot of complicated memos out there that need to be written about a variety of issues, like which are less controversial than torture, but which uh, could expose the lawyers to liability. Um, and I, you know, I, again, I, I, like I said, I, I don't think that there's any government lawyer will attempt to write a memo defining what torture is. If I was that lawyer, I would run away screaming and resign. Um, and I imagine every other lawyer in government has the exact same reaction. No, Jack Goldsmith resigned rather than try to define it, right? And the guy who did try to define it, the next guy who took the job, is on the Spanish list, right? So who's, who's going to be the government lawyer who wants to try to take on a task that appears to be impossible. Is this, is this the key? Nearly, is this what, the what, what I'm trying to get at, though, no, Jordan, hold on a second. We don't, I mean, it, what, I, what I'd like to get at, though, is this a case of, the, 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 of these lawyers being caught between, I mean, in, in this place where they're, for some reason, they feel like they have to write a legal justification for whatever the CIA is saying it's going to take to get the information that they want in a time when, when the nation is terrified about what might happen, and they are, and the CIA is under the gun to get any intelligence that they can, and the president says we need to fix this, do whatever it takes, and they do whatever it takes. They 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 say, all right, 
maybe in one, in one po from one point of view, this would be torture, but how can we look at it differently so it's not torture? How can we call these people enemy combatants, call this enhanced interrogation, and rewrite, redefine what it is that we're doing? I mean, they were under tremendous pressure. And Cassandra. Yeah, I, I don't think it was that conscious, honestly. Um, I think when you have legal advisors who are such true believers in the cause, no pressure required. Um, they're not, I mean, John Yu stands whole, behind that his That whole memory. process that Michael was pointing out about avoiding the State Department and avoiding right. the military lawyers, right. which would be standard procedure, I don't know. Yes. I'm assuming it would be. What, that, yeah. That's not conscious? Um, I, I think it was a conscious decision to exclude them, but John Yu still believes that he's right, they were wrong. He stands behind the analysis in his memo. It's been you know, vilified by legal scholars everywhere. Um, but he personally stands behind it. There's another point. If you put the dates in perspective, Ari Shapiro at NPR has said, and I haven't seen his evidence, but he says that uh, in the White House, before, uh, maybe six months before, I think he says April 2002, before the August, by the memo, before the memo, Gonzalez was approving uh, enhanced interrogation techniques. And the memo came out later, so it can't be a shield for Gonzalez, for what he approved, and for those that followed Gonzalez. And Ashcroft, we know from the Center of Armed Services report, was approving uh, waterboarding July 27th, just before the August 1st memo. And he approved other techniques on July 24th. So it doesn't work for Ashcroft, and it doesn't work for those that followed Ashcroft's authorization, which is the authorization uh, to commit water. Right? So but wait, but Jordan, why a, wouldn't it follow to the, the follow, but wait, wait, just hold on a second. Um, if Ashcroft does it, and then he gets the memo, and then after the memo, the subordinates do it, but they know of the memo, then why wouldn't the memo apply? But do they know, and do they ever know the memo? Nick Rostow made it very clear, and I, I believe that that's well, the case, that these memos the were circulated. The field has to get the memo, I doubt the CIA operative in their field not gets the memo. To do. They're not even going to think about it at the top. Right. The, right. the guy in the bottom doesn't get the memo. I'm sorry, the you're wrong. The guy in the, <laughs> does the guy in the bottom get the order? He has, he's, they know that they know that what they're being asked to do is is has been legal, le gone through legal. Doesn't move without legal nowadays. Okay, but it still functions. Is I mean, and as Jordan's saying, so the guy at the at the bottom may not see the memo. He may not get the email. But he knows there but, is a memo. Right. Okay. And for those of you who can't see the, the voice that's talking, Sorry. Nick Rostow was the was former staff, chief counsel of the National Security Council. And I was staff director of the Senate Intelligence. Oh. And I know something about this, okay, about the way the CIA operates and about this process. And I don't in any way defend John Yu. I'm just saying that the agency doesn't do this without thinking. They know exactly what the consequences are because they've lived since the church committee and before. Mm -hmm. And so they want a legal, I mean, they don't want independent counsel coming in prosecuting a CIA agent for doing something he or she thought was lawfully authorized by the president and without being able to hold up a piece of paper saying, the Justice Department told me it was legal. The Bible memo didn't come out until August. It's there. And the, we know that waterboarding was an issue before August. Okay. So there's some disconnect here. Perhaps. Um, I want to ask about international and interne the international courts and universal oh, jurisdiction. Um, uh, Michael, what's likely to happen in the Spanish courts, and is it likely to matter in the grand scheme of things? So I'm standing in for Kai Ambos, who unfortunately his planes got canceled. Okay, Kai. Um, but <laughs> I'll answer that. Um, first of all, there have been a number of cases filed throughout Europe, in France, Germany, and Spain. And in both France and in Germany, they have dismissed the cases. Um, those are on appeal. But the Spanish case seems to be picking up some momentum. And the particular judge who's been assigned this case is the same guy who took the Pinochet case um, and, and made such a, a big deal about it that the British House of Lords 
decided ultimately that Pinochet was extraditable and the Chilean government prosecuted him. And this guy wants to make sure that the individuals responsible for the torture, the authors of the memos and the people who maybe ordered them or directed them to write the memos, um, and you called them the Gang of Six, that, that's basically who's been indicted, um, that they stand for justice. And so right now, the immediate consequence is that those folks can't travel because Spain is very aggressive with extradition requests, just like with Pinochet being extradited from, well, requested for extradition from the United Kingdom. And so if they go anywhere that has an extradition treaty with Spain, they could be surrendered to this judge. And, and that means that right now there's an effect on them. Whether the case actually goes forward, I mean, they, they have had cases in Belgium and other countries against Henry Kissinger and others um, that never materialized to anything, but Henry doesn't travel anymore for those reasons. And, and that may be the, ult the ultimate punishment that these folks suffer is that they're stuck in the United States. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. We now have a new international criminal court that might have been on Venezuela. And there are 102, No, 108 countries. 108 parties now out of 192 states. And that's a significant number. And under the Article 12, as it turns out, of their treaty, it is possible for a U.S. national to be prosecuted before the ICC if the crime, the alleged crime, was committed in the territory of one of these parties. Think about a black site overseas. Or Afghanistan. Afghanistan or... is a party. Oh. So, um, and we've known that the, the prosecutor of the ICC has made some rumblings a year ago or a half a year ago about possible investigations of, uh, of Cheney and Rumsfeld. Well, Jordan, just three days ago, yeah. He was on his soapbox again, saying that yeah. this idea of an investigation is now an active investigation. And there is universal jurisdiction, and there are now institutional fora that are international, like the International Criminal Court, with some possibilities of prosecution. I'm rather amazed how quickly this a lot of stuff came out, and I was telling students it'll take 10 years, we'll have to digest this. This is like the dirty war in Argentina, where the president, a former president of Argentina, is under indictment. It takes a generation sometimes, but it happens. I'm rather amazed how quickly this is happening. Any comments from my colleagues? I think they're trying to, uh, the U.S. purposes, the statute of limitations, they're running up against it. Uh, so I think there's an issue What's that. the statute of limitations for torture? Um, I think there's, there's I, I'm blanking on the statute of limitations. There's something that next year would putting expire. Putting up a zero. There's no statute of limitations. No, but there's a statute of limitations for next year that was that they're running up against. Yeah, and then there's also um, the ethics the ethics proceedings, I think, there's some statute of limitations issues on the number of years after the actual act, which you can bring in. I don't actually know the details of this, but that's, that may be why these things are coming out. I, I want to ask Cassandra this, this other question about um, what this all means for who we are as Americans and what this, how things have changed since 9-11-2001. Right. Right. Well, part of my argument, right, is that things have changed over time. And I don't think that 2001 was actually the defining moment for that. I think it was 2005 when the Abu Ghraib pictures came out. Um, in 2001, you had, um, of course, you know, 9 11. Um, within a week after that, you had Cheney giving his famous dark side speech, suggesting that, you know, in response to this terrorist act, we were going to have to be willing to do some things that Americans typically don't like. Um, the American identity stayed pretty unified against torture, though. If you look at the polls that happened in those intervening years, um, Americans still viewed themselves very much as a people against torture. Um, in 2005, that changed. The immediate reaction to the Abu Ghraib photos was actually one of denial, which I think is actually fairly healthy, right? Americans saw themselves as a people who don't torture. Um, they're faced with these pictures of what looks a lot like torture. Um, and the response was, this isn't us. This is a few hillbilly kids. This is a few bad actors. This isn't America. Um, between 2005 and 2009, that started to change. And you started to have people who were much more likely to say, maybe we do torture. Maybe that's OK. Maybe we need to torture. Maybe torture isn't a bad thing. Um, and I think that change in attitude can actually be traced to, you know, certainly some of Vice President Cheney's speeches. Um, you know, some people have traced it also to 24, but, 
you know, with the, with the positive portrayal of torture in some instances. Um, but it did start to change, and so in the most, re and so in 2005, right, when the Abu Ghraib pictures came out, you had a majority of Americans who defined themselves as being against torture. In the summer of 2009, the latest poll came out, 52% of Americans, a fair majority, um, said it's okay to torture sometimes. And if you look at how that breaks down on a partisan divide, it's stark. Um, of those who identified themselves as Republicans, two-thirds said torture sometimes is okay. Um, those who identified themselves as Democrats, um, about a third said torture is sometimes okay. Um, so I think there has been a shift in identity. And what I'm afraid of, and why I almost wish it would take a generation for this to come out as opposed to happening so fast, mm. is I'm really afraid that if we go forward with prosecutions now, we're going to be reinforcing that partisan divide. People are going to commit more strongly to a belief that torture is okay. And will it be impossible to convict with a, a, a jury that's, um, that represents the numbers that you're citing? I think it would be, jury. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it would be difficult to convict, but my bigger fear is that we would get a conviction that would lack political legitimacy, and with changes in administration, we would basically solidify a policy of torture. What I think we haven't faced up to yet is that these weren't a few bad apples. We were lying to after those pictures came out. <laughs> and they knew they were lying. And, and now we know that there was serial criminality and cascading criminality down at the top. The police memos were created at the top. As John Hughes says in his book, we wanted to abandon the application of the Geneva Conventions, which itself is a violation of the Conventions and a violation of the Conventions. And we wanted to do that, as John Hughes said, so we could engage in coercive interrogation and an inner circle of the administration made those choices. And we now know more about the inner circle there were meetings in the White House at which the Vice President attended from time to time uh, of the National Security Council Principals Committee. And John used over there, not just writing memos. He's uh, apparently choreographing some of the stuff and it's in the White House where you can have real-time interrogations or you've got CIA tapes of interrogations. You know that Cheney has an office now over in the CIA headquarters where he can maybe view some of these interrogations, and um, there's much more to come out, but it's serial criminality over time, and it's cascading, and I don't think the American people understand that yet, even though some more has come out. I don't think we've understood the lessons of, of Nuremberg yet, and I don't think lawyers understand, that it, it, a lot of lawyers don't understand, this isn't just a matter of legal advice, it's a matter of criminality, it's called complicity. Uh, and then Stephanie, sorry. and then your questions. Yes, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure that, uh, I think what we're, I think I more agree more with Cassandra that what we have here is I think people looking at the same facts, and one, one group would say, maybe let's call them Republicans. Wow, they're working really hard to try to save the country, right? The other group says it's serial criminality. And if, if the country is 50-50 on that point, which I, I'm betting that is, um, I think what we're going to have is, I mean, uh, just from a, this may not be a good thing, but as a political matter, I think we're going to have is huge, obsessive political fighting and no resolution. Maybe a pro-torture consensus, maybe an anti-torture consensus, but enormous partisan divides, like the closest thing to Clinton impeachment that we'll get, and except much, much worse. Now, um, so I, I, do, I do think, I, I really do think that there's, it, it is fascinating, I, the data there suggests, it is fascinating how people really see it differently depending on their political viewpoint. Even when they describe the specific acts, the more details they give, the more popular the procedures get, right? Which, which is actually, you know, it, it is worrisome, right? Um, when you can imagine that there's this scary sort of stuff out there that you don't know, but you, you imagine the worst, and then once they release the memos, actually the, you know, it actually in some ways the popular support for a jump. So, ju hey, Julian, that's, that's, that's not a good idea, photos, right? So I'm just saying, but that's, so I'm just saying that the, that, that shouldn't affect the law, right, whether or not it's popular, like, and, and it shouldn't at all. But I do think that there is enough, that there will, one of the consequences of legal proceedings will be this enormous political divide. Just as a follow-up, you know these photos that there's a big debate about, the torture photos um, that Obama doesn't want to release for national security reasons, apparently they're really awful. Between you, Julian, and, and Cassandra, in, in the context of what you're talking about, what would happen if those do get released? And, and it looks like the courts may order them released. How is that going to affect your arguments? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess like 
I, I can't, I'm not great at reading the public yeah. opinion, obviously, but, but I, I wonder whether, I mean, it, it's weird. The American public has a strange sort of reaction to things that I, like, like again, maybe they'll say, oh, wow, that's cool, it's like 24, right? It's not as bad as 24, right? I don't know, I mean, and I don't think that would be a good thing, trust me on this, but the release of the original memos describing in detail the procedures did not have the impact I think on public opinion that people might have expected. We're not sure what the photos will do either. I don't think it's easy. I don't think we can say one way or the other which way it'll go. Julian, I wanted to, what's been described as what John Yu was after is, is sidestepping the Geneva Conventions and, and all of that. And he says that as apparently, I haven't read the book, but according to our esteemed guests here, that he, he says that in his book. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I guess I, I didn't read that part of the book, but I thought he said, <laughs> I thought he said, I, you know, I think that, you know, I, like he did in the legal opinion interpreting why he believed the Geneva Convention was not applicable, which uh, an approach that was adopted by several justices of the Supreme Court interpretation and other courts um, have adopted that interpretation. So it didn't seem to me an unreasonable interpretation. I mean, I think we can impute, you might say, well, he's trying to avoid getting the JAGs involved, and that seems like a really bad idea, and it's trying to avoid the State Department. I'm not sure that's criminal. I think if you have a legal interpretation that he was adopting, which was something that was plausible, was something that a number of courts did accept on the Geneva <coughs> Convention's point. I just don't see that as a criminal act. I think clearly it was a mistake, and I don't doubt it was a mistake. I just don't see it as a crime. What about, is it moral? It might be immoral, but it, I just don't see it as a crime. But whether or not... The Although the treaty interpretation thing, I, I doubt that was... You know, deciding whether something was a non-international armed conflict versus international armed conflict doesn't strike me as having huge moral sort of implications immediately anyway. But whether or not the Geneva Conventions apply, torture is illegal and it's prohibited not only in the Geneva Conventions but in the treaties that the U.S. has ratified that you can then get down into what is what constitutes torture. I want to just just very quickly two things. One is about the, the um, perceptions of torture being acceptable now. <laughs> and I, I, I know you laughed a bit when you mentioned this TV program, 24, um, but there's actually been work done on the impact on um, public understanding of a whole range of things influenced by television programs. Um, so there's, there's this article on the CSI effect uh, written by a former prosecutor, Professor uh, Tamara Lawson, looking at how um, uh, prosecutors, defense lawyers, and judges are dealing with this very, very real uh, impact on how juries are assessing um, pur you know, purported scientific evidence. And so I think with respect to the impact on perceptions of torture, we really do have to look at um, things like TV programs. But I, I want to uh, go back to the question of, well, it was a very stressful time. They were doing their best. They, they wanted to come up with something, et cetera. And just remind people that um, it's, it's not only in the Convention Against Torture, and it's not only in the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but also written into the Geneva Conventions that torture is prohibited at any time in any place. Who wrote the Geneva Conventions? They were survivors of a war that killed millions and millions of people. They were survivors of a time when wars going on, no one knew who was going to win. The country that they were a national of might not be there the next day. Very extreme situation that they had now made their way out of. In the treaties that I mentioned, it says explicitly, in all of the human rights treaties, it says explicitly, there is no derogation from the prohibition on torture, even in times of public emergency that threaten the life of the nation. So in writing this, they understood there will be stressful times. There will be times when um, you have to do everything you can, but there are certain limits to what a democratic society uh, can allow. But you know what? The, the one problem with what you're pointing out is this. The reason they are so obsessed about defining things not as torture, but rather as cruel and human and degrading treatment, is because there's a better legal argument to be made that the necessity defense might apply to things that aren't torture but are cruel and human and degrading treatment. There's a better argument, and I would say, no, just let me finish, Jordan. 
there have been some recent decisions from the international bodies that have, that have confirmed that the same non-derogation principle for torture should apply to the other. But if you just read the language of the treaty, as they did when they wrote the torture memos, it only applies to torture. And I think that's why they fixated on just saying, well, this isn't torture. And because they believed if they could define it as cruel and human and degrading treatment, then the necessity defense might apply. That's what they were trying to we're accomplish. Gonna, I, know, I know you want to get back at that, but we're going to get to questions from the, uh, from the audience here. Judge Rod, I think, is, is going to be first. And a microphone is headed your way, sir. No problem. I have a good voice. Yes, you do. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for our panelists. Uh, it's really wonderful discussion. Uh, you know, it's, it's this kind of momo, I have to consider the time when they wrote it. It's a difficult time also. And there is big debate, security, and, you know, threatening for the terrorist issues. Also, there is another point in my mind when the, the lawyer who wrote this momo, he never expects someone will, you know, use it to torture, as used as a Professor Sharp says, 200, 300 times. You know. But at the same time, I think it is, you know, using water is torture, you know. If he's, if he's came to my panel, no, it's different, you know, <laughs> it's torture. But it is, in the same time, it's a strong opinion at the specific time to not justify it, maybe exercise the legal materials. My question exactly, if the investigation starts in this situation, which is so different from Abu Ghraib, because Abu Ghraib is just a stop with the low level, you know, people. This kind of investigation will go to the high level people. Do you think there is any courageous lawyer, again, will write strong opinion to the White House in the future to, to protect the security, national security, or something like that? Thank you. Great question. Who wants to take it? Well, sure, I click. Uh, uh, the first part of the trade was, you know, it wasn't a few bad apples. We know, that. we know more about the memos that are coming on. And those memos were used in uh, Iraq. In fact, Major General, uh, Lieutenant General Sanchez had his own memo for about a month and a half authorized on stripping naked, fear up, harsh, use of dogs, use of military dogs. Um, so some of those tactics have been approved by Lieutenant General Sanchez before he went through his memo. But I don't, I don't know that I fully understand your question. I think, your question. I think Judge Ross, the point is, the in the it's, White House, similar the Julian, it's similar to what Julian, what Julian was saying before, that um, no, no attorney in the Department of Justice, is, if, if asked to write a, a, a definition of torture, is going to touch that. And I, would go, and, I would just go beyond that, too. Um, an attorney asks to define a variety of other things, right? The legality of uh, predator strikes outside of Pakistan, right? Especially as the ICC begins defining the crime of aggression and the crimes, you know, the variety. So there are, there are variety, that, that is something the Obama administration is engaged in and has authorized. I would not want to be the guy who wrote that yeah. memo. And, and I disagree with that. When I was at the State Department, there was a clearance process. And, and this is the same clearance process that applies to OLC memos before and after, but not during John Hughes' reign. OLC is the Office of Legal, Office of Legal Counsel. Counsel. What the clearance process does is it protects the lawyers because what you do is you write your draft opinion and you circulate it to all the other expert lawyers and all the other agencies and you get all their input and your final product is a mass product of a mass group of minds. That's good faith. And if you do that and you've done a good job on your memo, it doesn't matter what you've concluded. You're never going to be prosecuted because you did the right process. The, again, my problem here was that they purposely consciously cut out the legal experts, the people who knew how to interpret the torture convention, the people who knew how to interpret the Geneva Conventions because they were result-oriented. And then he puts it in a book and says, that's exactly what I was trying to do. And that kind of, it's the true believer. He, he thought that was the right result, but I think that's a confession. And we don't want those lawyers in the Department of Justice. The problem is that there's some what I call leftover lawyers from the prior administration still in DOJ. Riso still at State Department. At, uh, at, uh, as far as I know. Yeah, but if Eric Holder 
fires them, then he'll have the same problem well, that Alberto Gonzalez Holder, had. Holder has a constitutional duty. I don't know if people understand. Under Article 2, Section uh, 3 of our Constitution, the President of the United States has an unavoidable constitutional duty faithfully to execute the laws. And these laws include treaties that require extradition or prosecution. The Geneva Conventions for Respective Great, which is the Convention Against Torture. And that is an unavoidable, constitutionally based uh, requirement. That's what Eric Holder ultimately has to face up to, too. Uh, as he finds out more from the limited inquiry through a special prosecutor, he's going to have to face his constitutional duty uh, initiate prosecution or extradite all those who are reasonably accused. And then we're going to take another question. Actually, I was, I was going to toss a question out to the group, but I saw your hand up, so I'll come back to mine later. Okay. Uh, just a quick one. The um, CIA statute, as far as I know, uh, begins by saying, notwithstanding any other provision of law, the CIA will do what it's told to do. Um, and I wonder what you all think uh, the power of that kind of statute has in this context. Do you think the CIA was misused? Uh, you know, I mean, <coughs> violate Einstein, foreign so violate non disclosure. at this point, if they're told that it's okay by legal counsel, they can. No, only if it's not manifestly illegal. The question is, is waterboarding clearly illegal or not? Can, and can I throw out uh, one more... Questions out here. I want to make sure that we get to them quickly. Quickly, one more provocative thought, um, building on what Stephanie was just saying. Because if it wasn't provocative... <laughs> it wouldn't be <laughs> worth throwing out. Um, Diane Iman has pointed out that um, Durham's mandate is not to do an investigation. It's a pre-investigation. And she's made a really interesting analogy to what the International Yugoslavia Tribunal's um, mandate was 
uh, to look at the NATO airstrikes in 1999, they did a pre-investigation. And at the end of the day, they didn't go to a real investigation. They released a report. And there are some people who believe that the reason they're calling this a pre-investigation is that, in, in effect, what this is is a truth commission, that he's going to write a report, and that's all that's going to result from it. Um, uh, otherwise, why are they calling it a pre-investigation? I, I just, yeah. But I just point this out. It's an, it's an interesting question. Why, why are they using that term? Yeah. Uh, Thanks. So you folks have been uh, engaged in this interesting discussion about individual accountability, but it sounds to me as if we also need to talk about collective accountability, especially from what Jordan's been saying. So, uh, you know, typically when there's a collective failure, then there's some kind of uh, collective remedy in terms of accountability. And, and I would think that the place to start is with uh, the Office of Legal Counsel. And, and back to Michael's point, so what needs to be changed about the institution um, as, a, as a response for the for the collective failure that occurred. And, and rather than thinking about individual criminality, which is obviously one way to go, how should the system be changed um, as, as a way of, of um, somehow remedying um, what happened in this collective failure? I thought Michael answered that. We need uh, the normal back practice of interagency input. Well, but I, guess I guess the question is whether the normal, whether normal practice is enough, that is in terms of sort of customs, or whether we need to have something stronger yet to make sure that, that folks realize that that's an obligation that they have to, to get these. More than customs, a rule. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Well, and, and one way to accomplish that, of course, is legislation. Another is through a civil lawsuit. And we haven't talked much today, but there is a civil lawsuit against John Yu brought by Padilla, one of these uh, detainees. And Jose the court, Padilla? Yeah, and the court. Padilla? Uh, exactly. depending, on, depending on who's pronouncing it? And the court in San Francisco has recently rejected the motion to dismiss. The case is going forward. And it may be that the civil lawsuit, which can in some ways be much broader than a criminal case, can, can set some of the standards for the government to use in the future. He was, remind us though, he was, Jose Padilla was, was going to carry out a terrorist act and the information that was found about that was found through uh, enhanced interrogation or or was he tortured? No, 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 he's the, no. He's the, he's the he's, dirty yeah. bomber. He was the dirty bomber from yeah, Chicago, can... I think. Right. Um, so was there, I mean, what it, how does the torture stuff come in with Jose Padilla? Was he tortured himself? He alleges. The, yeah, he claims he was. He claims he was detained unlawfully. He claims that people following the memos did things to him that they shouldn't have done, and he's going to litigate it. This, this is, I just want to kind of put it out here. My paper that will be published by this journal addresses civil liability of individuals. So I hope somebody will read it later. But this is a whole other area of accountability. What also is occurring more frequently is the efforts to disbar attorneys that were involved in alleged uh, complicity with respect to the members. So stay tuned for that. I think it's a great question you asked because we, we are looking at ways of establishing accountability, but if we're looking forward, we need to try and learn what we can about what happened in order to make sure it doesn't happen again. So, you know, how can we put in place some kind of mechanism so that when one of the lawyers in the administration writes a dissenting memo and is told to destroy all copies of it, right, what, you know, how, how can we make sure that that kind of squelching doesn't take place? So I think it's a very important question seeing the way forward, what, what kinds of things can we put in place? Provisions and things of that sort. I think we have some, some other questions all over the place. You get to pick. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll go back after that. Um, because of my advanced years, I've unfortunately missed a lot of the conversation up there from the speakers, except for Mr. Rosto over there. <laughs> I managed to hear him most of the time. And by the way, I sort of got the impression from him <clears throat> that if the CIA wanted to pull the fingernails out of a uh, person to interrogate them, they could have gotten maybe a memo from a consul that said it was just a case of a, uh, getting a severe manicure, but not torture. 
that's what it appears to be. What about the persons or the entity that requests these memos? They're obviously just looking for a cover my fanny memo. And that's all these ever were. So there's more accountability also for the people that ask for those cover my little fanny. Uh, the problem with that is that, again, it depends how you look at it, right? The people who ask for the memos, also if they hadn't asked for the memos, they're also being prosecuted for not asking for the memos. So, I mean, I think they're kind of losing either way. I mean, you can't, you can't fault them for asking for the memos. And imputing motives is just a question of looking at... There was, of was course, the, the option of not torturing. Right. Or, or, <laughs> no, I understand that, but if, they want it, if they're conducting interrogations, they want guidance on what they can do. That's not unreasonable, right? And if they hadn't asked for memos on what we can do in interrogations... Then presumably they would have had to build rapport with the detainees and, and get information that way. Is that, I mean, that's the option. Well, I mean, they could, have got, they could have got guidance that said you can't do anything, right? But, I mean, they, but w do you think it was wrong for them to ask? That's what I'm, I'm stunned at the idea that they're supposed to be faulted for asking and then faulted for following the advice they got. It just seems, I mean, I understand people are outraged at what happened, but, I mean, it's, there's not, it doesn't seem to me that everyone is acting in bad faith. Well, isn't the argument, though, that uh, what, he, what he's raising is that, um, this, all of this is, if all of this is against the Geneva Conventions, and that's understood by, by universally understood, whether you're in the CIA or the Office of Legal Counsel, that, um, you know, so why go to that, why, you know, why raise that then? It, if it's illegal, it's illegal. Why ask for permission to do something and put the Office of Legal Counsel into that position of having to twist the law around or redefine what you're doing, call it something else? so that it's no longer a duck. Yeah, and Andra, Cassandra Robertson, um, alluded to the fact that there was a, a really unusual grouping of these high-level lawyers at the White House and at the Office of Legal Counsel. Um, they called themselves, according to John Yu and Jack Goldsmith, the War Council. They gave themselves a clubby name. There was five of them. One of them, who I think plays the most insidious role, um, is Cheney's lawyer, Addington who was best man at Haynes' wedding. And Haynes is Rumsfeld's lawyer. And then John Yu, of course, is the true believer who wants to make it all happen. And when you get a group of people like that who want to cut out all the professionals, the military lawyers that we've had at this conference, the State Department lawyers that we have at this conference, that's when it becomes a cabal. And that's, I think, what we should be concerned about avoiding. Yeah. I, I agree with that. But I also would question the premise a little bit. Um, I don't think that lawyers are agreed that the conduct violated the Geneva Conventions. Um, I think that's the majority view. I think that is definitely the super majority view in academia. Um, yeah. And, but do you agree? I mean, no, the question is whether the Geneva Conventions apply. Whether they apply is actually deeply, yeah. was deeply disputed at the time. That's why it wasn't it wasn't obvious to them that that's why they asked for legal advice. In fact, I, don't, I think even today people might disagree on exactly how the Geneva Conventions might or might not apply. Well, I know Jordan has a view, but, but I, I think there are other people who might disagree. And that's not, this is exactly the type of things why you ask for legal advice. But, but Cassandra, I mean, what about the, the, the question that was raised that um, is there accountability at the CIA for asking for permission or is the accountability at the Office of Legal Counsel? I mean, I have to agree with Julie, and I, I think it's never wrong to ask the question. Um, I think you do have to wonder whether the question was asked in good faith. I think that's you know, subject to debate. Um, I think people have debated it. Um, it's hard to believe that it was a, hey, I'm just wondering. Like, say I wanted to tie somebody down right, right. and pour water in their, in their mouth. I'm, right. just curious, I'm just curious, hypothetical right. here. Well, I mean, I think they were very aware from the beginning that this was on the line, right? This is something that some people would want to prosecute for. And I think the way they viewed it is they thought, you know, we have enemies out there who are going to try to prosecute. We need to make sure that what we do is within the letter of the law. Um, John Yu's book is so interesting because he uses that term lawfare, which I know you, you talked about a lot. Um, but he basically sees his opponents as using something called lawfare to use technical legal requirements in a way that... That weakens the United States. Yeah, yeah, essentially. No. And, and yeah. You remember, the memos were, the Viking memo was written after the fact. 
after waterboarding had been used and some of these other techniques had been used. We can't, we shouldn't lose track of that. And again, the issue is not good lawyering or bad lawyering. It's a question of responsibility. It's a question of criminal complicity. Mm -hmm. We have a question up at the very top in the red. And then behind me, somewhere, I think, too. Thank you. I wanted to build off the point made a few moments ago about collective failure. And I think we need to look at this in a slightly broader term than it just being bad legal advice. I think one of the biggest barriers to accountability in any form, whether we're talking in a U.S. criminal context, a civil context, the international context, the biggest obstacle we have is this culture of secrecy. We have lost all transparency. It has taken us now eight years and we're still litigating trying to find out what happened that's numerous FOIA requests various lawsuits like in the Jeppesen case with the state secrets privilege being raised over and over again I think we need to address in talking about how we're gonna hold people accountable how we're even gonna get enough information to hold people accountable when there's been this utter lack and, and resistance to any kind of transparency okay just this conversation actually makes me feel more charitable toward <laughs> sort of releasing more information, just because I think, as you know, I know that I think the obvious reason for not releasing it, I assume, other than just nefarious reasons, is would threaten sort of some ongoing project or something like that, or ongoing lives of actual people in the field. But it seems to me that, at least in this issue and in a variety of other issues, actually, there continues to be a lot of disagreement about what exactly happened, what happened in August 2002, what meeting do they have in the World Council, when did. And actually, in some ways, I'm maybe, I'm maybe kind of leaning toward now, maybe let's just, let's just let it all hang out. Because I think actually, when, sometimes when the facts come out, we, they go in ways that we don't necessarily know which way they go. And actually, we're not sure what the consequences of it will be. So maybe more facts do need to come out. Well, and it's not unique. I mean, if you think back in history, our government has always been secretive. And from time to time, there have been these kinds of occasions where there have been efforts to shed light. So the Church Commission to look at the assassinations throughout Latin America, the Iran-Contra inquiry to look at the Iran-Contra affair. Um, every generation has had its torture memo controversy. We just keep repeating the same mistakes. Uh, two quick questions for Professor Paust. I'm curious what the authority would be, domestic authority would be, for the notion that the Department of Justice is legally obligated to conduct criminal prosecutions, because there's certainly in American law a longstanding uh, uh, tradition of prosecutorial discretion as pretty fundamental uh, that can be guided by statute, but but without explicit congressional direction, giving courts laws law to apply uh, can't be imposed. And I know in, in, overseas there are different standards, but I'm curious about the domestic source for that. And then for for my colleague uh, Professor Scharf. I was wanted to push a little bit on the targeted killing example. Um, we know that the current administration has increased the use of targeted killing uh, with predator drones. We know that they are aware and we are aware that that has increased collateral damage. We know that the State Department has said, acknowledged publicly, that the, that the interpretation of international law by, outs, by others, such as the International Red Cross, is problematic for our current practices. And that our current practices are in conflict with that. And just yesterday, the Wall Street Journal reported that the International Criminal Court has opened a preliminary investigation into uh, the death of civilians due to uh, targeted killing efforts by the United States in Afghanistan. So given that, do you, do you really think that State Department or Justice Department attorneys r really think that process alone would protect them from something similar, given that there are international authorities that would say that what the current administration is doing with predator drones is contrary to international law and then potentially domestic law as well? Very large question. So can you retain that entire question? I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Built into this formula that's a treaty based formula that Michael and I know very, very well um, initiate prosecution or extradite is good faith prosecutorial discretion. In other words, it's a duty of the United States that's treaty based, and I view it as a constitutionally based duty of Eric Holder as the Attorney General and President Obama. It's an unavoidable treaty obligation. But we can meet that obligation through good faith rendering or extradition, or in the alternative, initiation in good faith of prosecution. And sometimes the prosecutor doesn't have enough evidence to move forward. And that might meet our treaty obligation. Even under the Rome Statute, the 
for the International Criminal Court, Michael is an expert here too, um, there's built in this uh, notion that we can generalize for the audience as a, a, if there's a good faith effort at investigation and or prosecution in country X, um, the ICC will not move ahead with prosecution. But that begs the question whether there's a good faith. Uh, is there domestic authority? Uh, this is international Supreme, law. A Supreme Court decision and no, a statute, no, no. because yeah. I think some would argue that, that absent a statute, certainly the Supreme Court has suggested as such in some of its prosecutorial discretion decisions, without a statute providing clear guidelines at which a court could judge the conduct of a prosecution, that prosecutorial discretion is, is at the, the discretion of the executive and is unreviewable and unenforceable. Yeah, under U.S. law. Well, we're, we're talking about treaty-based obligations. Um, out the area of the car is the Latin phrase to initiate prosecution. And I'm just saying that built into the treaty-based obligation is a good faith effort uh, by the prosecutor to move forward. And then you, you don't have enough evidence to move on. You don't have to convict. And you can even uh, not go to trial. You can go to trial and make your best uh, effort. And uh, there's just not enough evidence to convict. The United States will be living up in the president would be living up to that treaty obligation if it's done in good faith. And then just to qualify, it's the obligation to investigate, and then if there's credible evidence found to and, and John, as, as you and I have discussed many times, often there's an international obligation that applies to our executive branch, to the government as a whole, that is not domestically enforceable in the courts. So it could be a case where we can't force the Department of Justice to prosecute, they can use their discretion, but the international community would say, you, you do have to prosecute or at least have a good faith investigation or you're violating the treaty. Now, on your second question, um, he was asking about the legality of uh, targeted killings, which is basically using a Predator drone with Hellfire missiles and shooting down, and often a lot of civilians are killed. And the legal rules that apply to that is that when you're on the battlefield, you have to discriminate against civilians, you have to have a necessity of what you're doing, there has to be proportionality. That's a lot more squeamish, I have to admit, as a standard, and it's subject to much more interpretation than something like what is torture, where you have all of these court cases, international bodies, and domestic court cases defining things as torture, and I think that's the difference. So you don't think that when, when, the, when the military asks either the State Department or the Justice Department, can you tell, give us what the, the on-the-ground initiative that we should look for so that we know there's necessity and we know we can tell whoever's operating yeah. to pull the trigger and they will never be liable. Is there a lawyer that's going well, to write that memo? Amos Giora, who was here uh, but has recently left, he used to have to do this for the Israeli Defense Office every day. And in fact, that is what our military, military lawyers do. And they come up with the rules of engagement um, in an interagency process like we described, not in a little cabal and a little smoke-filled room or whatever, like what happened with uh, the torture memos. I think we are, we're going to take one final question um, because we are running over, and I think it's uh, appropriate that the director of the Center for Ethics asks that final question. Well, uh, as a military ethicist, um, I see a tremendous amount of damage that has followed on the practices that were done under the previous administration, going all through the ranks. And I guess my question to anyone who wants to tackle it is there was such a great impact by everything from the Abu Ghraib images to um, the, the later revealed memos and, and just everything that leaked out. There was such a tremendous impact. What can possibly be done of all the things that you've discussed that would have an equal impact to the rank and file. I, I guess what I'm worried about is that a lot of the responses you've discussed would be discussed again by us, by, <laughs> by uh, people in academia and in certain circles of the government and, and such forth, but not necessarily get the kind of public, broad public attention that it would take to do what I feel is necessary, and that's to restore the principle that torture is wrong. The principle's been damaged, and restoring it is going to take something significant and indeed symbolic. And I'm wondering what you think has that impact. <laughs> I've spent a lot of years trying to figure out how to affect public opinion. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I don't have a specific answer for you, but I think that public education, however it is achieved, um, would be important. I think at bottom, the, one of the reasons that there was this desire to go ahead and approve these techniques was the thought that they, this was the only way or the way to actually get the information we need, but we've heard from, we hear from so many experienced interrogators, you actually get better information. Uh, you know, the, um, so many interrogators have said that extreme pain will cause the individual, the detainee, to say anything in order to get out of it. It wastes a lot of time then tracking that lead down and you find a sign, so and so and so. Anyway, just as part of the, the um, you know, just public education, however it's achieved, is. And just as we should learn more about the memos, I almost agree with you. It's the first time. About the memos and, and what was happening. There are some proud moments that should be emphasized. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. quite often, people that I know were JAG officers or Alberto Mora, mm -hmm. who's publicly known as a person who said no. We should know more about those who said no. And, and sometimes I said, finally, I, I know especially among professional military, they say no and don't decide. Well, they resign and do that quietly. And we should have that as part of the mix of what comes out. Perhaps they can join us at the next panel. Uh, next year. <laughs> uh, with that, we're going to um, we'll, we'll close the conference. Please, a round of applause.